Topic Note 7.1 Coral Reef Formation, Growth, and Distribution Coral reefs are probably one of the most iconic components to tropical oceanic destinations around the world. So today we're going to really look at where they are, how they form, and pretty much what's so cool about them. Of course, we always want to start off with our main ideas, and that means that students will be able to explain the formation, growth, and global distribution of coral reefs. Pretty simple, right? But of course, here's the details, the learning goals. Now make sure you're paying attention to these as you go through all your note sets so that you know what you're responsible for, especially when it comes to the upcoming tests. So having said that, let's get underwater. So as it turns out, we live very close to the world's third largest barrier reef system. And I'm diving on it in this video. This is the Florida Keys, the reef track right offshore. Uh, and I try and go down there a couple of times a year. I can't get enough of getting under the water and swimming and looking and checking out these coral reefs. And remember, coral reefs are one of the most diverse ecosystems in the ocean. And of course, people come here to Florida to dive and snorkel them. And of course, the fishing that's around them is also really incredible. So this is a really important component to the economy of our state. Not to mention, it's just really cool. So let's backtrack just a little bit. What is a reef? So traditionally, it's defined as a chain of rocks uh, or coral under the surface of the water. And to be honest, the big factor here is it provides shelter and surface area for marine life to live. So you can have a reef that's not a coral reef. You can also have a coral reef. It all just depends on what the structure that's underlying the system is. Now we're going to focus on coral reefs today. Now corals, of course, are animals. Now this sort of stumped early ecologists and biologists because they sort of look like plants underwater. And as it turns out, they actually have plant cells, basically algae, living inside them. But they are really animals. Corals are members of the phylum Cnidaria. And the major characteristic for cnidarians is stinging cells. And you might know this if you've ever been stung by a jellyfish, because jellyfish are also in phylum cnidaria. But the really force behind the developing these massive coral reefs is the fact that these corals lay down calcium carbonate as their skeletal system. And they expand on that as they grow, creating these massive reef formations. Now the picture on the top is a live star coral. And if you take the living tissue away, what you get is what you see on the bottom. Now, as just a side note, beyond just corals, uh, there also are some calcareous algae that also help build the structure of the reef as well. Now, corals that are found in tropical regions build these large coral reef structures. And they are what we call hermatypic corals. And they produce these large reefs in relationships with these small symbiotic plant cells called zooxanthellae. And these zooxanthellae are found within the tissue of the coral. And you only see this particular relationship, and it is mutualistic, in the tropics. Now, as you might have figured out, there are corals that live outside of the tropical zone, and some in the tropical zone, that do not build coral reefs. They are called ahermatypic corals and they do not house that symbiotic algae. This is actually a picture of a coral called Tabastria, and I actually find it sometimes under pilings, uh, under docks, uh, or under ledges in the reef, where it doesn't have any exposure to sunlight. They are feeding primarily on zooplankton. So now let's go back to hermatypic corals and stony coral colony formation. Now these massive coral colonies have to start somewhere, and they can start by a fragmentation, which basically a little piece of coral breaks off of a larger coral lands somewhere and it starts to grow, or they can go through sexual reproduction. So in sexual reproduction, we basically begin with a planktonic planula larvae, and that's what you see on the left there. And that larvae will float around and eventually settle on a hard substrate. 
that larvae will now metamorphose into a little coral polyp. And from there, that coral polyp will start to secrete calcium carbonate and it will create this little cup called a coralite. Now from this point on, it will go through asexual reproduction in the form of budding. And really that's where the coral polyp replicates itself. And that's how you go from one little polyp to a huge colony. Now remember, even though they don't quite look like it, corals are animals and they do prey upon living things. Specifically, corals prey on zooplankton. And if you look at their polyps, they have all these little tentacles, very much like a little anemone. And those tentacles will sting and grab zooplankton, pull them into their mouths and eat them. Now, of course, because corals can't get up and swim around, they have to wait for the plankton to come to them. So they do like nice currents that will bring the plankton along. But the real story here is the zooxanthellae. 90% of hermatypic coral nutrition comes from these tiny little symbiotic algae. And zooxanthellae happen to be dinoflagellates. And if you remember that from when we talked about plankton, um, I mentioned it a few times there. So these dinoflagellates actually live as mutualistic relationships with the coral embedded in the coral tissue. It's these zooxanthellae that actually give coral their color. If you take the coral out, they become very white, which is basically because you have calcium carbonate as their skeletal system. And that's where the term is coined as coral bleaching. That's what happens when the zooxanthellae are expelled and all you have left is the coral tissue itself and the corals end up looking very white because all you're being able to see is that calcium carbonate skeleton. So let's take a closer look at this mutualistic relationship. The zooxanthellae basically provide food in the form of glucose through photosynthesis to the coral. Along the way, they also provide amino acids, oxygen, which of course is a byproduct of photosynthesis, and it removes CO2, which of course also is part of photosynthesis. So what does the zooxanthellae get out of it? Well, the coral provides a suitable place for the zooxanthellae to live. It basically provides a protected home. It also provides an in-house source for carbon dioxide for photosynthesis and, of course, something that's really important to growing plants and algae, and that's nitrogen. Now remember, when we talked about productivity in the open ocean, we mentioned that it is a nutrient-limited environment. So the phytoplankton out there are really governed by inputs of nutrients. Coral reefs tend to grow in areas that are nutrient-poor, so the water can be very clear for them. So by embedding themselves in the coral tissue, they're basically providing themselves with an in-house source of nutrients and nitrogen. Now there's another aspect of this relationship that we're actually still learning about even today. When these hermatypic corals have a healthy population of zooxanthellae living within their tissues, the calcification rate, or the rate at which the corals lay down calcium carbonate and build their skeletons and get larger, that rate is high. But if something happens to compromise that relationship between the zooxanthellae and the coral, and the zooxanthellae end up being expelled, and you end up undergoing coral bleaching, the calcification rates go down significantly, and the calcium that is laid down is much weaker and more brittle. Basically, what I'm saying here is, is without that zooxanthellae, the corals cannot build massive coral reefs. Of course, there are other factors at play, and corals, as they're distributed globally, are really governed by a few of these, specifically temperature, for example. It needs to be somewhere between 20 and 25 degrees Celsius. And if it's below 18 degrees Celsius, corals really aren't going to survive very well. Now remember, I am talking about hermatypic reef building corals here. There are, of course, corals that do grow in colder climates. Then we have depth and light. Now, of course, if you have a photosynthetic algae living in your tissues and you're dependent on it, that algae needs to be able to see sunlight. So obviously depth and light are going to have a factor here. And generally what we say is anywhere between about 25 meters or less. And of course, the more murky the water would be, the shallower you would have to have coral. 
Now salinity also is a component here as well. Corals like regular old oceanic salinity without a whole lot of freshwater input. So usually we're talking anywhere between 32 and 35 parts per thousand. Now when we talked about light and depth, we're talking about light penetration. So sedimentation is the other component to that. So if you have a lot of sediments going along in the water column, that's going to really kill your corals. Uh, this is why you don't see a lot of coral reefs right at the mouths of rivers, even if it is in the tropics, or very limited coral reef growth, um, because they do need clear water. Also, if you have dredging operations in the area that's going to silt up the water, you can cause a lot of damage to the growing corals in the area. And of course, another limitation is emergence into air. Corals really don't do well if they're exposed to air, especially for more than an hour or two which is why most corals are going to grow under the low tide mark, uh, which is why if you look at a coral reef, especially the crest of the coral reef, you're going to see corals growing up to a certain point and then stopping, almost like somebody just cut them off with a knife or something in one level. Um, that's because all of the corals are growing up as high as they possibly can, and then they just can't grow any higher because of the water level. The, they can't expose themselves permanently to air. So if you take all these factors and sort of work it in globally, this is a diagram that basically shows you all the little red dots are coral reefs around the world. And you'll notice that they generally occur in the tropics globally. Uh, and of course, they're also gonna be in areas where we know we have nutrient poor and clear water relatively regularly. Now we're gonna talk about the various different types of coral reefs, and we'll start with the atolls. And atolls are basically these horseshoe or ring-shaped reefs. A lot of times we have them out in the Pacific, and they're really kind of these tropical, spectacular little looking islands that people would love to go to. Uh, and they have a very specific formation pattern, which we'll talk about in a minute. Next, we have barrier and fringing reefs. Now, these are going to occur next to land masses. And really, the difference between the two is a barrier generally is separated by, from the land by a good bit of distance, you know, five miles, 10 miles, something like that. A fringing reef is going to exist right there along the shoreline, um, very close to uh, where the beach is. Patch reefs are generally small little, exactly what the name is, patch reefs, uh, and literally they tend to be found behind the barrier reef and the fringing reef, or between the barrier and the fringing reef and the land component that they're, they're in. And so you'll see these all over and they'll be mixed in. You'll also see them in the lagoons within atolls as well. So now let's talk about the evolution of a coral reef and its formation. And interestingly enough, this theory was first postulated by Charles Darwin after his voyage of the Beagle. So people focus on Charles Darwin in terms of his theory of evolution or specifically natural selection, but he did make a lot of other really important discoveries and observations all around the world. Now, of course, his ideas on corals also were developed throughout the later years with other scientists, and so now we call it the Darwin-Dana-Daly theory, or the subsidence or compensation theory. Lots of names, I know, but they all basically mean the same thing. And here is how it starts. It starts with a fringing reef that forms around a newly formed volcanic island. Now, of course, after the volcano is formed, eventually the water and the wind and everything will start to erode the island away and it will start to subside or basically sink uh, through those processes. So here's what happens. That fringing reef is going to try and keep up with the sinking rate of the island. And as that happens, if the subsidence is equal to the rate of coral growth upwards, then the fringing reef will eventually become a barrier reef it'll become a little bit more separated by whatever's left of the island. Eventually, the island itself will completely disappear, and you're only left with that barrier reef ring and a lagoon within the middle of it. Now, the lagoon itself tends to persist because you tend to have a lot of sedimentation rates, basically from other living organisms that are growing and depositing their, their exoskeletons and coral fragments and things like that in there. So it kind of keeps it up. Uh, over time. And that is how a coral atoll is formed. So to confirm this theory, 
what scientists did is they drilled into the limestone, basically the old coral rock, until they ran into the volcanic rock below. And sometimes this can be very deep. In the Marshall Islands, they found that volcanic rock under 1,283 meters of limestone, basically 60 million years of coral growth. Now we can also look at some coral atolls that didn't actually make it. Basically, the subsidence uh, occurred faster than the coral could grow. And we know this by looking at the geology of seafloors. We have these structures called gyodes, uh, which are basically these little flat-topped mountains underwater. And what really happened here is the erosion was so fast that as the volcanic island eroded, the corals couldn't catch up, and eventually you ended up with an underground or underwater seamount that's very flat. Now, of course, fringing and barrier reefs do occur in other areas, not just atolls, and they will occur against continents and other land masses. And again, you think about this, corals need to be shallow, and so they need those continental margins or something to be on to be able to be shallower. Uh, open ocean doesn't really work for them. Generally, uh, both fringing and barrier reefs tend to be much younger, especially in the Atlantic Ocean, where we're looking at anywhere between 10 to 15,000 years ago. Now we can do some what we call geomorphology to basically work on kind of how coral reefs have grown over the years. And we do this by drilling cores through the coral. And when we drill these cores through the coral and we pull these cores out, we can actually look at growth rates over time. And what you're looking at on the right is a picture of a core being drilled. And then of course the results of that coral uh, drilling on the bottom. And you'll notice it looks very much like the, the bands of tree rings. Uh, and this is really important because we can actually tell growth rates. Were there years where there were a lot of growth? Were there years where there were not a lot of growth? Uh, and we can compare those just like we would with tree rings. We can also do some carbon dating. So for example, carbon 14 uh, decays to carbon 12 over time. And so we can look at the ratio between those two to determine the age up to about 50,000 years. So in terms of short-term geology, we sort of can get an idea of what the oceans were like using these coral corals. Now you might say 50,000 years is not short term. Well, to geologists, it really is. Remember, humans live a very, very short lifespan compared to the geologic history of the Earth. All right, that's enough for me. It's time to turn it over to you. And your in-depth question today is, what would happen to coral reefs if sea levels rise too fast? So I want you to think about that and remember to do your summary notes and we'll see you next time.